I would like to introduce our sponsor and Richard. So basically, thank you, Ham Rice, for uh, sponsoring this particular segment on CBD uh, oil and hemp extracts in baking. Hemp Rice is a global leader in CBD and hemp extracts and is a subsidiary of parent company Lane Natural Ingredients. Ham Rice's uh, product, Bake Rice, uh, Bake Rice provides CBD and hemp extract solutions specifically designed to meet the needs of the bakery. Um, also, it can be used in edibles and confection, confections manufacturing. Okay, and we have Colette here. Colette Kukuk is Vice President of Global Marketing for Hemp Rice and Lay Natural Ingredients. She has decades of experience in food service, restaurant, and top Fortune 100 business consulting. We also have Richard here, and Richard is a classically trained French baker, certified master baker, and he holds a degree in baking science from Kansas State University with a minor in cereal chemistry and a degree in sales and marketing from Benjamin Morel, France. Richard spent years working in the industry and in the retail bakeries, and um, I've known him since his days at Hostess. Uh, he's run, uh, he's worked for large CPG brands and he's held numerous uh, R&D position. He now runs uh, bakinginnovation.com. All right, so I'm going to ask you both to unmute your, um, uh, your, your, yourselves on Zoom. And uh, Richard, can you please go ahead first and, and let us know how, um, how, what did you do? What did you do to develop the products for Ham Rice? Okay, so uh, good morning or good afternoon, everybody, you know, for all of those watching. And thank you for the opportunity, uh, Colette, to uh, get the product from Ham Price, which I received last week. Uh, and it's very, very, very easy to use. The key, as Dr. Lynn Carson was mentioning, is precision. So to all the bakers watching, forget about baker's percent for a second. Let's work in formula percents where you have 100% and you know exactly, exactly how much you're putting in, which is what I did. So I wanted to, to make it fun a little bit for everybody. Uh, and, and the first sample I made is a, again, hazelnut, I guess, hazelnut nut covers a little bit of a, any nut. I roasted the nuts. And I made a cookie and which has a lot of seeds and flax seeds and sesame seeds and chocolate chip. And I added the hemp oil and to, you know, in precision to deliver, to make about 20 cookies. And I mixed it with my butter and creamed it with the butter. And after that is basically a recipe that is similar to a sable or a, a shortbread type of cookie. And I added on top of it, I added hemp protein and hemp flour and with a lot of a whole grain to sort of go on trend with protein and CBD. I'm mean, like, it's fantastic. You could get your CBD, your protein, your whole grain, and you're good to go. So that's one. And that's something that, and as I mentioned, I can forward the formula for people who are interested uh, uh, to do. And the other uh, concept that I'm working on to make it fun was saying, what if, you know, let's think of a commercial bakery on a large scale and what could we do with hemp or hemp oil or CBD? And the other one is I made Twinkies. Uh, mine is the cream, there's no cream. So it's just a, a, a Twinkie in a Twinkie pan. It's a commercial formulation. And what I did here is I added same on formula percent and not baker's percent. I broke it down and I know I made eight cakes. So I calculated using the uh, powder and I put the amount of CBD in the cake and as you can see it's just a cake they were made yesterday uh, what flavor is the cake right now it's vanilla so okay. people people could add the cream I wanted to bake it into the cake because of you know to to your point is once you make it in the cream you want to make sure it's because it's uncooked uh, and if it goes back and being injected in the cake, I was like, yeah, it would be good to do it just in a cake portion. And it could be made into a cupcake. And, you know, your imagination or your creation will 
it's it's up to you. But it's very easy to use. Uh, I also uh, uh, I've been playing too in the cookies. I put a little bit of a, a cranberry extract as an antioxidant to, and again. I'm doing it for myself just to play around, but that, you know, to stabilization of the fat, if you're looking at a longer shelf life, as mentioned before, you know, we're not really, it's a new territory for all of us. It's for the bakers watching, you know, what else could you do? There are solutions around uh, that could be tested and validated. Uh, and from a, from a flavor standpoint, uh, uh, you know, the oil is personally, it's easier to use. I know the powder comes with other ingredients that could change the flavor a bit, but it all it's all about working with it and what's your preference, whether or not you want to work with a powder or whether or not you want to work with an oil. But all, so all both I have a quick question on that one because I used a powder as well. Uh, and Colette, Colette, correct me if I'm wrong. Um, there was a really strong smell and taste from it, but the hazelnut and the chocolate covered it. So my concern is when you do it in the vanilla side, how are you gonna cover that? I would cover it by using the oil. I think you'll be better off. Oh, uh, the, oil's, the, the oil's less strong. The, less yeah, strong. the, 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 okay, the, oil, the oil is a little easier. And okay. as to your point, chocolate or uh, nuts or anything like that, but we're right here, if it were a, let's say a true authentic Twinkie or a cream cake, by putting the cream and flavoring the cream or using different masking agents, which could be done as well. You can cover up the taste. There is a slight taste of bitterness of earthy, nutty, nutty notes coming, coming from it, but nothing, you know, again, it changes from a control if you're eating a typical cake and yeah, you take one with a CBD added to it. There's a slight difference, but it's not objection. I, I didn't think it was objectionable where you're like, oh, this doesn't taste good. It's just working around the formula to mask it. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm, you're welcome. That's great. Any other ideas? Well, I, I think, yeah, I would, have, I would have a lot of ideas with it. I think you can go crazy with it because the sky's the limit. You know, I was I was even thinking of doing it in a, in a typical Italian cake called a, a torta caprese, which is sort of melted chocolate and putting it there and and I was like, well, that would be neat too. But again, it's it's about what do you want to deliver? And remember, uh, how much are you trying to deliver? Five milligrams, 20 milligrams, 50. Uh, and I don't know if there's an upper limit where people will go. I tried the, I tried the product. I, I, I felt that, you know, I've, people tend to think, oh my God, I'm going to use hemp and it's going to be psychoactive. I'm going to be all weird and loopy. Uh, nothing, nothing happened to me. Uh, maybe I was a little more relaxed, uh, but uh, I, I and I'm, yeah, not, it's, it's a great product. So I, I think and easy to use. So, and I don't know, you know, from a commercial standpoint to uh, Dr. Lynn Carson's point, you know, maybe the stability of it and how to keep it because it's not an oil you want to just leave it on the floor at a bakery where it's 105 degrees. It's something you probably need to refrigerate and maybe you use different, you know, botanical antioxidants to the products to uh, uh, ensure that the product had a, has a decent shelf life in your finished product. I totally agree, Richard. And um, I would like to add to that. Basically, uh, when I worked with it, um, it to me, it, it felt like that was a, an extra step there to be really careful because this particular ingredient is so expensive, you know, so extra eyes on that. That's my only other caution. Um, and I actually ate one cookie and I felt nothing, you know? So my question, Colette is, is that, is 30 milligrams really, um, nothing? <laughs> ha, yeah. Um, you know, what's really important is, um, and I just want to make sure the broader audience understands, um, you know, when we're talking about hemp extracts, we are talking about, uh, less than 0.3% of the psychoactive component, which um, Dr. Carson, you explained is THC. Um, you know, what's emerging right now as kind of a, a commonly understood uh, dosage is 25 milligrams. And you're not going to experience uh, psychoactive, uh, you know, 
uh, feel from that because that's associated with THC. And that's exactly why hemp extracts and CBD are coming to the mainstream uh, because we can get the other benefits that are associated with it. And, um, you know, I wanted to add, Richard, I couldn't agree more that the sky is really the limit. And we're converging at a really interesting time. I love that we have a phenomenal innovation partner like Bakerpedia um, for this because this is an emerging market and deregulation has now accelerated all of our benefit to uh, explore with this. And um, it also is a really critical time because we're all sitting here at least six feet apart in the midst of a pandemic. And the pandemic, um, you know, raise your hand if you feel increased stress, if you feel increased isolation, um, mental health crisis is um, accelerating. And, you know, I, I've been getting uh, notifications on a business end how, you know, HR departments are increasingly having to really consider the lasting effects of this on the workplace. Um, the genie's out of the bottle with this because consumers understand CBD and hemp extracts. When I say hemp extracts, that's including other beneficial cannabinoids. Um, so CBD is one isolated cannabinoid, but um, we're really a fan of at the benefits of all of the minor cannabinoids. So the plant comes uh, as it comes from mother nature, rich with multiple cannabinoids. So, you know, we're really a fan of a broad spectrum, um, which includes those benefits. Um, but we're seeing that this can offer relief to people. And um, I'm gonna just make one added note. Um, you know, the common forms right now are topical, personal care, and then, um, you know, evolving a massive market in tinctures where that's, you know, that classic dropper that people are taking sublingually under their tongue. Um, but the mainstream consumer wants consumption formats that they're familiar with. The, that feels medicine-like to them. And they're I can think of no better consumption formats than to enjoy this with something that's hazelnut and chocolate. <laughs> um, I love that you experimented with that. Um, but, you know, we're seeing this now. Uh, there will be an increasing path to deregulating this to be allowed in food and beverage. And it is ripe for innovation. It's ripe for um, experimenting with those consumption formats that the consumers want. And with the pandemic that consumers need, we have an opioid crisis. Um, we have many, many pathways um, that this will evolve for massive and tremendous growth over the next few years. Yeah, I, I feel like this is the right time to do the R and D, um, mainly because we're in the pandemic and we, you know, have extra creative resources. Um, once it's it's legalized, it's off to the racers. Races, you know, it's just like who gets there first with the best process and the most streamlined, you know, supply chain. <laughs> I love that you said that because. Yeah what we're seeing ahead of deregulation and, you know, and I, I call it the, the second gold rush. Um, you know, this is an emerging industry. So you've got fast movers, um, those that are willing to take the risk while it's not legally allowed right now in food and beverage, please do not stop innovating. It is coming. Um, and you've got kind of the smaller, nimble, uh, small to medium companies willing to take on some of what that risk could be bringing a product to market. Um, and they're doing it. Um, they are getting that fat, uh, first mover advantage, trying to build brand recognition. Um, but, you know, we work with the biggest brands in the world. They are doing R&D. They are, uh, you know, looking to this increasing path of deregulation we all want. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, I'm so excited. We have over 40 people on the seminar today. So hopefully some new ideas will come out from this particular seminar. 
Um, so why don't we go to the questions and we'll start answering those questions. Okay, so first one is, do you have any information on how long full spectrum CBD extract will last if stored in black jars in a cool environment? That is a great question. Um, I can get um, some more specific science to my answer on that um, from our innovation team and our R&D team. Um, but in general, the way that we provide the hemp extracts um, and definitely the keywords there um, in a cool, dark environment, um, you know, we're posting shelf lives of about 18 months. Um, and then, you know, once you um, put that into a, a baked good kind of item, and I love that you experimented with it both with heat in the form of the Twinkie, Richard, and then also with a filling with those cookies, um, you know, we recommend the same kind of storage, dark, cool environment. So um, I can get a little more specific on some of the science. Any of the questions that come in, I'd love to have an opportunity to um, send Bakerpedia the response. So, uh, so everybody can get the benefit to get that. That'd be great. Yeah. Um, so next question is, has anyone worked on gluten-free recipes using CBD extract? I can yes. say no, I have not, but okay. Colette, Richard? Well, uh, I, I, I would say as mentioned earlier, it's same, same principle. As long as you have a gluten-free formula, and again, using formula percent, don't, don't overdo it. You can just replace a portion of your fat. And if you use either the powder or you use the oil, it's just a, such a small amount because any gluten-free cake, it doesn't mean you have no fat. So remove a portion of your fat and plug in that CBD oil or the CBD uh, powder into it. And that's the same thing. And you just bake it the same way and just change the flavor if necessary, or maybe up the flavor, but that's simple. It's very easy to do. Agreed, agreed. And, I, I, uh, and I've worked with the oil, so that are no negative interactions, you know, that's going to hurt the system. So it's just used like any other regular you know, palm oil shortening or, you know, canola oil function, okay? And um, with gluten-free recipes, so you really need to look at the binding um, aspect of uh, your gluten-free flour. Um, you can do anything from modified tapioca starches to fibers, you know, I've seen a new technology with Neurovant fiber into gluten-free and that works as well. Um, all right, uh, we have also a gluten-free paper that you should download, it's available right now. <laughs> Next question, um, is, it, is it not yet legally allowed to use in the US? Colette, you wanna answer that? Yeah, that is a great question. So there was the 2018 Farm Bill, and that allowed hemp to be legally grown and for its derivatives to no longer be considered controlled substances. Um, but CBD is a scheduled drug, meaning that is a controlled substance. So currently, it is not legally allowed as an ingestible. Now, as I say that, you're seeing tons of products when you go to your local retail outlets, you go online, and that's a little bit of what I described as this gold rush, and that people see there's consumer demand, and you're seeing these smaller companies and medium-sized companies bringing these products to market, trying to get that traction for brand recognition, brand awareness, and that first mover advantage. So um, we're looking for a pathway um, in, in looking uh, with uh, great optimism and anticipation that there will be a legal pathway for hemp extracts, which include CBD and minor cannabinoids in the consumption formats that uh, everybody wants, which is ingestibles, you know, ready to go snacks, uh, baked goods, um, edibles, confections, beverages. And when you look, this is predicated by uh, 
thousands and thousands of years of use. Um, so uh, we see it coming. So uh, yes, it is not currently legal uh, to sell those goods. They are being sold. Um, we encourage heavy innovation uh, and R&D, and we see that pathway for legalization coming. Yep, I agree. Um, that's a great answer. I get that question all the time, a lot. Okay, let's go to the next question. Would you suggest infusing your butter with the oil and then adding it to your cookie formula? What is the percentage to use? Well, I can, I can uh, quickly uh, talk I'll, about- I'll let you go first, Richard, because I have my answer too. <laughs> okay, as, as mentioned earlier, like for the cookies, I calculated, it's all based on calculation of how much you're delivering and how many cookies. So for example, if your recipe and you have to use 12% of butter and talking formula percents, meaning the total uh, ingredients with the eggs and the water. And if you are making 200 cookies, then you will have to do the math and say 200 cookies with 25 milligrams and I want to deliver 200 times 25 milligrams, then, and then you know that the powder for every 1.5 grams, you're delivering 250 milligrams, so that's 10 cookies, so that you, you do the math and then you'll get to that. And then you use your butter. And maybe the question, if you have a production and you do that, you could maybe pre-blend for the week of what you need and label it and know what it is so you don't it doesn't cross-contaminate other uh, because that's about keeping it very safe. And then it's easy to do. And then you don't have to touch and pipe it. It's easier to, to scale up versus micro scaling. Yeah. And this is where the innovation and risk part comes in, right, Richard? I need to point it out. I mean, everything is cool and dandy at the R&D bench top. But when it comes to production, <laughs> it's not easy. Label it properly. Put it aside, make sure people are aware, don't use that butter. <laughs> Put it on your bread. Really expensive butter, but I, I agree with you. I would definitely go that route in the production side of things. You know, R&D side, not really, you know, not, not really, um, uh, uh, important on where you put it, but production, commercialization, absolutely follow what Richard said. And you really need, that's why, you know, like what Colette says, like this is all risky, you know, it's all risky. If you do anything wrong, you got to throw your good product away. Like if you accidentally put CBD oil butter in your normal production cookies, you have to throw your normal production cookies away, you know? So that's the risk that you have to take in understanding how to commercialize this product. I mean, bench top, it's fine. But when it comes to commercialization, industrialization, that's when you really need to make sure your process is, is well-defined so that you don't waste money there, okay? So Richard knows a lot about this, all right? If you're going to commercialize this product, Richard is the, a great person to consult in terms of procedures, you know, standardization and methodology. So, you know, I'm just selling you, Richard. I think that's what you're good at. <laughs> Thank you, You've done this like a hundred times, you know? So um, yeah, definitely keep an eye. But that, that's a great recommendation, Richard. And, and, and just a quick, uh, quick point, you know, I was just doing some quick math. As I was mentioning, if you make 200 cookies uh, and you're trying to deliver 25 milligrams, that would need, you would need uh, uh, 30 grams of the powder into your butter, so it's small. And bakers are used to, to you, you know, doing like a 50 pound bag or a cube of 50 pound of butter. So that's when you can't take it lightly. You, you, it's, it's precision is key. Correct, thanks for pointing that out. All right, next question. I've been trying to make flavor MCT coconut oil slash CBD tinctures. When I use the recommended percentage of flavoring, it seems not to A, cover the earthy tones of the CBD oil and B, not have as rich a flavor profile as I would like. Oh, that is such a great question. And um, any ideas, Colette or Richard, to how to deal with the flavor, the earthy tones? 
Uh, I'm going to just answer in general and defer over to you, Richard, um, you know, from a more baking science point of view. Um, you know, this aspect of terpenes is really interesting because that's a lot of the taste that uh, that we're getting kind of that more earthy, musky or, you know, kind of rich taste. Um, and some people like that taste and some uh, want to mask and cover. So I do know, especially if you're looking at uh, natural and clean label um, kinds of solutions, there are mask Asking agents um, and bitter blockers um, that can help. And, you know, we're really looking at our partnership with you to really explore those pl uh, flavor profiles and different solutions, um, you know, for whether it's citrus uh, additions or any other kinds of flavorings that you might be putting in and what the resulting uh, sensory uh, of that is. And uh, and to to add to Colette's answer, my personal experience, I've been working with hemp, not the oil, but hemp since 2018 in different application. It has that grainy, earthy flavor. What I'm finding out is that when you work it with basically roasting ingredients, like let's say if you're working with seeds, roast the seeds. Uh, uh, roast the hazelnut because now you're bringing darker notes, sort of caramel notes, and then we'll sort of cover up naturally the green tor terpene flavor you're getting from the amp oil. Uh, I personally don't mind the greeny flavor, but it could be for the novice who've never tried it to be like, oh, what is that flavor? It's a little better. It's like, it's like basically if you're used to eating uh, uh, white bread and you move to 100% whole wheat bread, you get those sort of tannics or tannins in the, in the background, but there are ways around it. And it's about being creative, how hard to mask it the best. And chocolate is fantastic for that, by the way. Thank you. So I hope that helps, Charlie. Uh, next question is, do you have a, do you have an oil product that is free from terpenes that would work in baking? That's a great question. So the answer is yes. Um, there still is some taste, um, you know, and solutions um, to be explored and innovated, uh, innovated with depending on your application. Um, but we do, uh, we have ways to remove the terpenes and then also to remediate and push them back in uh, to product. Um, so I'll call those, you know, cleaner taste formulas um, that uh, yes, we do. Awesome. Thank you. Okay. I am going to ask you one more question. Yeah. And I think that's just going to help clear up a lot of stuff. What is the difference between hemp oil and extract versus CBD? Yes, that's a great question. So uh, hemp oil uh, or hemp seed oil, um, that is a legitimate product offering. And I think it's a great product offering. Um, in some cases, I see some brands trying to piggyback onto the wave of CBD and hemp extracts, which are different. Um, and it can be confusing and you may be paying more than uh, what you're getting. So let me explain hemp oil or hemp seed oil, again, a legitimate product in and of its own, but does not contain any CBD. So if you're being marketed to in a fuzzy fashion <laughs> that makes it seem like there's CBD in there, I would be wary uh, because especially if you're looking at the price point, you may be paying uh, for CBD, but there's no CBD in there. Um, remember, I call it the liquid gold, and it's worth its weight in gold. Um, but you want to make sure you're getting uh, the right product. So now we get into um, a little bit more clarity, but there's still some fuzziness. So uh, you want to look for things that are labeled CBD oil or hemp extracts um, can still uh, have some fuzziness in terms of what the definition is. Um, but where hemp oil or hemp seed oil is solely extracted from the hemp seeds, no CBD, hemp uh, extracts and CBD oil are extracted from the flower or the leaves and will have 
CBD, and as I talked about before, those um, minor cannabinoids as well, if you're not buying an isolate. I'm, we're really fans of um, broad spectrum because we really believe in those minor cannabinoids and the beneficial effects. I th we think there's a long runway for growth um, in broad spectrum. So again, that's going to be commonly referred to as CBD oil, which maybe is only CBD, maybe includes those other minor cannabinoids, or the way that we use the term hemp extracts, which lets us know we're talking about more than just CBD. Awesome. Um, I'm so glad we have all this recorded because I'm just going to play back what you just said to everyone who asks me that. <laughs> it is such a common question, you know? Well, it's confusing and, you know, as this is an emerging uh, market and you know, we've talked before, we need more regulation, we need more standardization in the way that we refer to things, our, our vernacular that we use. So we see this in laboratory testing. So um, that will come with increasing deregulation where we'll all have to, you know, evolve on a more common vernacular and common uh, basis. That's true. All right. We're almost done with the hour. Before we go, I'm going to squeeze in one more question. What are your top tips for finding a reputable supplier? This is to both Colette and Richard. Good. Okay. Um, let's see. Uh, I think one of the biggest pieces is you want to make sure that you pick a reputable supplier. Um, you know, I've used this word emerging industry a lot. It's brought a lot of newcomers. It's brought a lot of people in for this gold rush. Um, you want to be sure that they're well capitalized. That is essential, not only so they can support your growth and your scaling, um, but also so they can support their own business. Uh, we've got lots of uh, extractors in particular right now going out of business. Um, they uh, did not capitalize well. So you want to make sure you're dealing with this partner, a uh, partner that can really be there for you and be there uh, reliably for you. Look for quality markers like CGMP, um, that they've got paperwork, in-house laboratories, plus third-party uh, laboratory testing. Um, make sure they can provide you a consistent product um, to support um, the label claims of the amount of CBD that you have in your product and that it's just a consistent supply. And um, I'm going to add one more piece that, you know, we have a very sophisticated extraction uh, process, a lot of IP in the way that we do extraction. That is our core competency. We're full supply chain um, from agronomy to, you know, applications focus, but the the really where the rubber hits the road is in the extraction process. And that is where a supplier can add a lot of economic value to you that they're managing their yields and they're managing that biomass for extraction. And I, I kind of say everybody can look really big on uh, a website, um, but it really comes down to, you know, infrastructure and uh, equipment and true capitalization. I would ask those hard questions. We've invested $70 million into our facility and innovation here in the United States. Ask those questions. All right. Richard, do you have any tips on choosing a reliable supplier? Uh, what a uh, good answer, Colette. Yes, I do. Uh, you know, having worked with hemp, but not the oil, the hemp heart and the hemp protein and the fiber. And, and one quick note too on hemp, uh, a good friend of mine who's a, who's a chef, and we're talking about hemp, he said, well, hemp is becoming the new vegetarian, new vegan pig, because pig is one of the only animal where you can reuse everything from the French culture. And now hemp, you can use everything. You can make plastic, you can make textile, you can make uh, uh, food. You, you, it's, it's limitless in terms of what you can do. But the way I've chosen the hemp is the extraction. If you're looking at an oil, understand how they extract it and how they do it. I'm always uh, looking for basically suppliers where I understand their whole supply chain. You know, are they, are they growing their hemp? 
are they close to the uh, the farmers? It's almost like wheat. You know, you know, you, you buy wheat, but where's where's your wheat coming from? Who's milling it? And with hemp, it's it's still small and it's still close where you can relate to it. And the last thing, when I you know work with hemp, I've gotten several samples from different vendors, and they have different flavors based on the process. And I always pick what I think is the best quality flavor and the best you know use for different bakery application. And that takes a little time. And and not all vendors like flour, not all flowers the same, but not all hemp is the same. Correct. And I, I, I agree, Richard, and I support what Richard said. And I'm also a true believer in third party labs. Um, I, I, I always like when I was in charge of QA and QC in both bakeries, um, I've always, uh, you know, sent it out for lab testing. And once the lab test, the third party lab testing comes back and confirm you know, the, the, the key points that I'm looking for um, after three or four times, I trust the COAs, you know. So that's how I would do it. I just look at your COAs and make sure everything um, important is on there. And if you need an extra pair of eyes, you know, Richard is really good at this as well. And he's more than happy to look at your COAs and tell you what to look for, okay? All right, so we have come to an hour, folks. I think uh, that's enough <laughs> for everyone. <laughs> we all need to rush back to work. And um, so if there are any more questions, uh, unfortunately, we can't get to all questions right now. If there are more questions, come to our forum, our Baker Forum, and uh, we will further engage there as well. Uh, a copy of this video is gonna be available next week on our YouTube channel, and again, um, uh, Colette's information, and if you need a sample, it's on our CBD oil uh, baking page. So go there and download uh, and ask for a sample. And um, thank you, Colette. Thank you, Richard. Really thank you. Time. And thank you to all the attendees for taking time out um, from your day, your busy day, to listen to what we have to say about CBD and hemp extracts. Thank you, everyone. Bye.